NASA recently announced that they finally found liquid water flowing on today's Mars. So traveling to Mars is no longer a science fiction. Maybe some of us will become Martians. But simply imagining how harsh a Martian life could be just want make me to appreciate how beautiful our planet is. So here she is, beautiful blue oceans, green land masses, and also a home for more than 8.7 million species of life. So it's a truly remarkable feeling to be surrounded by all forms of animals, plants, fungi, and microbes. And this is a remarkable biodiversity, so visual and vivid to our eyes. But today, I'm going to tell you a secret and hidden layer of biodiversity, the chemical diversity. So I am a biologist and chemist working at the Whitehead Institute. And in almost every single species we examined in the lab, they contain thousands to even millions of these structurally diverse chemicals. And just thinking about the recent advance in technology in telescope make us to realize there are more than 100 billion galaxies beyond our own Milky Way, each containing more than 100 billion stars. We just came to the realization that there is an astonishingly complex and vast universe of small molecules or chemicals in nature. Actually, chemistry is a beautiful language that all living organisms use to communicate with each other. And altogether, that chemical communication shapes uh, how our ecosystems work. So these small chemicals are actually very small, so you can't really see them. But you must have smelled them by your nose. Just walk into a garden and take a deep breath. So the distinct fragrances coming from flowers and grasses are from these millions of volatile compounds emitted from the plants. Of course, bees and butterflies were never mistaken their flowers to collect um, nectar. In the same time, pollinator, pollinate these flowers in return. Of course, if you just dive into the unknown chemical space, it isn't always pleasant. So, for example, this particular case, Gimpi Gimpi, also known as the singing tree, is, is a large shrub native to eastern Australia. So its leaves is covered by millions of hollow and venom-containing hair cells. Stung by them isn't fun, so it causes excruciating pain. So that pain actually lasts for months, even decades. It happens that this plant has evolved the ability to make this very unique neurotoxin known as moraidin. So it's a very hydrophobic compound which will stain underneath your skin and cause pain. Of course, other than these occasional horror stories, we as humans are particularly good at harnessing the good benefits from the natural chemicals. So here are exam some examples, ranging from using spices for cooking to using all sorts of exotic perfumes for social surroundings, or from drinking a cup of coffee to get your daily dose of caffeine to burning coal to get energy and heat. Of course, the natural chemical world has also provided the majority of the drugs we use today to treat human houses, to treat human diseases. For example, the traditional herbal-based medicine has been used in multiple cultures for thousands of years. And today, in the, in the past 100 years, more and more single therapeutic compounds are being isolated from their native host and being used in the clinics. So here, I want to talk about a particular case of such, which is really inspiring to me. So this story involves this compound called artemisinin. So it's a compound discovered by this Chinese um, chemist, Yu Yu Tu, during the 1970s from its native host, Artemisia annua. So it's a remarkable story. So when Yu Yu Tu started her research, she was digging into the literature about ancient traditional medicine, and she found this book dated back to 1,600 years ago, authored by Ge Hong. Um, so this book, its name is Prescriptions for Emergencies. And this book, it's documented that this plant can treat symptoms related to malaria. And very interestingly, in this very old prescription, also specified 
that the plant has to be prepared in cold water. So this is very different from a typical way of preparing ancient uh, remedy in China involving boiling water. So later on, Uriel 2 found, indeed, this compound is very sensitive to heat and will get decomposed if you boil it. And she then modified her, her method to isolate this compound and save the millions of people's lives. For her work, she was given the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So it's a great story. It's very in inspirational for research in my lab. Now equipped with much more advanced molecular biology and chemistry tools, we're really at a golden age to rediscover the old wisdoms contained in this traditional medicine around the globe to come up with new and better treatments for human disease. So I've been talking about small natural chemicals. They're very small, but how small are they really intuitively? So let's all together doing a thought experiment involving cutting an onion. I, I like to use this case because we know the onion defends itself by chemical weapons. When we cut it, it put up some chemicals which make us tear. So let's always continually cutting an onion into halves and let's see how many times we need to cut to get to the size to this chemical that make us to tear. So maybe some guesses how many times we need to cut this onion? Hundreds. Hundreds. Close. Okay, let's see. So it happens that if we cut an onion eight times, we get to the scale of cells. Under a light microscope, we can see the nucleus and also the plant cell wall. So if we keep cutting, we get to the size of the chromosome. This is where the DNA is, where the blueprint of all life forms is wrapped around in these structures. So if we cut an onion 20 times, we get to the size of this large machinery known as ribosome, where all the proteins are made by this in every living cell. If we cut an onion 22 times, we get to the size of a protein. So we have tens of thousands of proteins working in our cell, producing, actually many are en enzymes manufacturing these natural chemicals I was talking about. So just cut an onion in half for only 24 times. We're getting to this molecule. The name is a mouthful, and, but this is the one that caused us to tear when we cut the onion in the first place. And if we stirring at it, it's composed of four types of atoms carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. And if I zoom myself, or shrink myself a billion times, I'll be standing by this molecule. Actually, the, the extremely diverse chemical world arises by just simply bonding these small number of atoms in different three-dimensional fashions to give rise to all sorts of different physical chemical properties. For this particular case, being volatile, and pungent to our eyes. So chemicals from nature can be good, and actually the increase in demand for the healing power from nature has really prompted the, the development or the boom of the herbal supplement industry. So if you search online, you'll find thousands of these herbal remedies. So when people on this side of the world really enjoying these benefits brought from these chemicals, one thing you may not know that it may be causing ecological disaster on the other side of, of the world. Because of this high profit and also the fact that many of these botanicals cannot be cultivated and have to be collected from the wild. People are destroying nature. They're collecting these from the wild. So I'm, I'm going to show you three cases. So these are medic medicinal plants which are found to have very high value in treating different diseases now be be become endangered because of human consumption. So on the left, so this is a tree called Pacific U. It's a tree that produces a very high value chemotherapy drug, Pacodexel, in, in its own bark. And I'm showing this very disturbing image because the whole park of this tree has been stripped off. And the tree takes 100 years to grow and it's left to die. In the middle, the fern moss is a cute little plant native to southern China. So in the early 2000s, people found it produced this hupacin A compound, which can alleviate symptoms related to Alzheimer's just in the last 15 years. 
we have lost this plant in the natural world. Uh, and the same story for golden root. So golden root is a plant used in Tibetan medicine and produce this adaptogen compound known as salicylside. So this plant now it becomes very popular in the sub herbal supplement market. Now has entirely driven this plant to almost extinction. So how can we harness the healing power of nature without destroying it. So in my lab at the Whitehead Institute, we're combining the state-of-art genomics and the metabolomics techniques to try to figure out how plants make these high-value therapeutic compounds. In this case, in the golden roots, we identify the pathways that how this silicide molecule can be made from tyrosine, one of the 20 amino acids. And by knowing what are the genes are required for making this molecule, we can transplant the whole pathway from golden root to something like baker's yeast, so that we can use yeast fermentation to produce a lot of this. So this process is already known for making beer, so it's not that difficult to evolve this to make silicide. How about the case for Pacific U? Scientists around the world are working really hard to find alternative ways to supply paclitaxel for the use in the clinic. The good, good news is, although it's still a working in progress, people have been using tissue culture to supply um, the production of paclitaxel. And we're trying very hard to come up with alternative ways, for example, methods like semi-synthetic approach or a total metabolic engineer approach so that we can make yeast to produce paclitaxel. Even for this very scary case of stinging tree, the tr native tribes um, in South America has been using a related plant known as stinging nettle to treat arthritis. So by figuring out how stinging tree makes its molecule moriting and how this compound interacts with our body, we might be on a new path towards finding new cures for arthritis. It's truly a remarkable time to be at an interface between biology and chemistry by decoding the chemical languages of nature. We will ultimately be able to engineer more efficient and sustainable systems to produce high value chemicals, drugs, fuel, and materials. And this is happening now. And this will impact our life in many good ways in the foreseeable future. Thank you.